This is Dylan FM, the podcast that goes deep into the work and world of Bob Dylan. If you love Dylan, you're in the right place with your host, Craig Danuloff. For 25 of our last 26 episodes, we talked about time out of mind. In many of those shows, guests referred to Dylan's early 90s acoustic albums as the place where Bob got on the road that led him to time out of mind. We're starting season two here at Dylan FM, and this season we're going to track that road. Like Ginger Rogers, we're going to do it backwards. So our first focus will be those two early 90s acoustic albums, Good As I've Been to You and World Gone Wrong. Then later this year, we'll revisit some of the 80s albums, specifically the ones that get all the bad press. And then finally, we'll end the year with a deep dive into street legal. We'll spend about three months on each, looking at them from as many angles as we can. We'll do that here on the podcast, on our blog and Substack, on social media, and perhaps even in some more live streaming events. Like last season, when we went deep on Time Out of Mind, there will be a lot of free shows and free posts for everyone to enjoy. But we're going to increase the percentage of our stuff that's exclusively for paid members and subscribers. I hope that we demonstrated last season our ability to deliver. And as you can imagine, doing all this stuff takes a lot of time. There's more than a few hard costs. And while it's fun to do, to say that we do it all for free is a bit of an overstatement. So we're going to try and encourage more subscribers by giving more and more value to people who sign up. If you like what we're doing, please see the show notes and learn how you can join or support us. There are more ways than ever, including, by the way, a scholarship program. So anyone that really wants to hear all this but can't afford it can do so. Our deep thanks to the many people who have already become premium members and have supported us thus far. One way to more fully appreciate Dylan is to sometimes zoom in real close and sometimes pull back and look at the big picture. In episode two of season one, we offered one oversimplified way to look at Bob's entire career. In that phase one is the insanely productive period of incredible success that lasted 16 years from 1961 to 1977. Phase two followed that with a long stretch of time where not everything he did was received with the same universal acclaim. This is 18 years between 1978 and 1996. And phase three is what happened from 1997 onward, which Jochen Markhorst proclaimed in the episode he was on last year, when Bob became an old master and once again enjoyed broad acclaim and endless accolades, a period which continues today. On this map of the world, we're spending this season in the middle phase. We're doing that in part because it explains everything that happened leading up to Time Out of Mind, but also because it broadly gets less attention, and it's a bit underappreciated having to stand in between those two phases of incredible success. Let's start in 1991. In some ways, I think this is where the campaign to restore Dylan's image began. I'd separate that from his artistic resurgence, of course, but I think the public image sets the stage for the artistic process that came later, so I think it's important. There are two key events in 1991, an otherwise not very eventful year in Dylan's life. The first was the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award that he got in February, which, if it already hadn't existed, might have inspired the phrase, you find out when you reach the top that you're on the bottom. Normally, getting a Lifetime Achievement Award from the most visible organization in your industry would be a milestone, an accomplishment, something to be proud of, and it would bolster a reputation. But serious Dylan fans know that Bob was just 50 years old, and it's an award that's usually given when you've made your contributions, but not much more is expected of you. And perhaps the record company pushed for it at that time because they didn't expect much more. Dylan gave a memorable performance and gave a memorable speech but they were not crowd pleasers, and quite a few would say they were disasters. But let's look at it another way. For people who aren't serious Dylan fans, who don't know what he's saying or what he said that night, the social and institutional message of getting that award was in a way the start of a public rebuild. 
What we always hear about Dylan in the 80s was that he was broadly in the popular press and in the general music market forgotten and considered a has-been. But they don't give Lifetime Achievement Awards to forgotten has-beens. They give them to beloved and transformative people. So in the long march to create the Bob Dylan that he would become again, in the broad public eye, this was an important first step. And what happened the very next month? The Bootleg Series Volume 1 through 3 was released. It's really too bad it didn't come out a month before the Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award. Imagine the buzz in the room if everyone had had a few weeks with that incredible box. That box followed the success of Biograph that was a few years before and made it clear to the music community and music fans that Dylan certainly shouldn't be forgotten. A few months later, in June of 1992, Dylan went into Acme Studios in Chicago with David Bromberg with the intent of cutting an acoustic folk album. The Olaf Files say that he spent two weeks in Chicago taping with Bromberg and his band. We think there were 26 songs recorded, primarily folk and blues materials, some of which include The Lady from Baltimore, Polly Vaughn, Casey Jones, Duncan and Brady, Catskill Serenade, Rise Again, World of Fools, and Nobody's Fault But Mine. Two of those had a 25-person gospel choir. But for whatever reason, Bob decided that this wasn't the album he wanted to put out. Two of the tracks later appeared on Telltale Signs. And almost immediately, Bob went home and started recording the songs that became Good As I've Been To You. There are 13 songs on that album, and it's generally believed that the You Belong To Me track, later released on the Natural Born Killers soundtrack, came from these sessions. Bob recorded all of this alone at home, with Debbie Gold as producer, and Makesha Ryan as engineer. About five years ago, Makesha talked to a podcast called The Double Stop with host Brian Sword. The interview covered his entire career, including work with bands such as Guns N' Roses and Megadeth, but also dove deep into Makesha's work on Good As I've Been To You and World Gone Wrong. We're going to listen to that now. Huge thanks to The Double Stop podcast and Brian Sword for capturing this interview and giving us permission to use it here. There's a link to the full interview in the show notes. Now, in the early 90s, you also had the opportunity to work with Bob Dylan a couple times. Yes, I did. Now, tell me about that, because that sounds absolutely fascinating. That was, I'll tell you, I mean, okay, Debbie Gold was my manager, and uh Debbie Gold, she passed away earlier this year and uh, it was very sad. She died of uh, lung cancer. I go and meet Bob and start working with him, record a couple of songs. And and uh, he says to Debbie, he says, I really like this guy. I want to make a whole record with him. It's like, oh, okay. So, um, so it ended up that I started did the whole record with him and we, we worked for three months. That, that record, Good As I've Been to You, is the, was the most fun record I ever made in my whole life. I had more fun making that record than any other time. Debbie Gold and I had a ball doing it. Deb, uh, I think Bob had a ball doing it. He just had a lot of fun. It was an amazing experience. We did it in, in Bob's garage. And uh, so I drove out to Malibu every day and went to Bob's garage and, and recorded recorded this record in his garage. And, and it was just an amazing experience. It was just, uh, and we just had this really relaxed, it was me, Debbie Gold and Bob Dylan in his studio, in his house. And he would, you know, take a break and he'd go into the house and, or he'd go outside and smoke a cigarette or he'd smoke a cigarette in the, in the studio, which we did at that time. You know, we, nobody smokes in the control rooms anymore, but I, I was, you know, he, he would smoke in there and, and, uh, he was, he was great. He taught me some of the greatest re- lessons ever in my life. It was just, um, he was the most intelligent guy I ever worked with. And, uh, as you can tell, I'm a huge fan of Bob. I think Bob is an awesome guy. And, uh, yeah, he, I don't know how much you want it, want me to tell you about that, but yeah, there were some amazing oh, I'll things. Take as much as I can get because it's brilliant. 
Well, I'll, I'll tell you the, the one story that makes the biggest impression on me even to this day. Sure. And he, uh, he would, he would record, he'd do a song and he would record take after take after take after take of these songs. And if these songs were other people's songs. So he was very, very vigilant about doing another person's song, doing it justice. So he do take after take after take after take. And, you know, he, he do it in every key imaginable, every tempo he do it in every, every voice. He would try every different thing. So, so we're getting to the, towards the end of the, of a reel of tape. And he says, uh, he says, hey, Nikesha, uh, you, you have room for another take on there? I look at the tape and I'm going, you know, yeah, sure, sure, Bob, we got no room for another take. And he goes, you sure you got room? I go, yeah, I'm sure. So, uh, so I hit record and he cuts the tempo in half. <laughs> so <laughs> all of a sudden I'm going, I don't know if I have enough tape on here to record this. So I'm standing over the tape machine sweat pouring off my brow, it's dripping onto the tape machine. I'm having to avoid it, hitting the tape. And he gets all the way to the last chorus, about halfway through the last chorus, and the tape falls off. So I get on the talk back and I go, Bob, I'm really sorry. I didn't know you were going to cut the tempo in half. And, and uh, um, uh, I didn't get, I got everything but the last chorus, the last bit of the last chorus. He goes, he goes, oh, that's okay. I want to hear it. And he, I think that was pretty good. So, so I put it back up and, and uh, rewind it and hit play. And we listen to the whole thing, whole song from beginning to end. And he looks at me and he kind of nods his head and he goes, yeah, yeah. And he, he walks out into the, into the studio and he starts working on a completely different song. So I put up a reel of tape and he starts working on this completely different song. And about an hour later, he goes, uh, Hey, hey, Macasia, you know that song where the tape ran out? Uh, I said, yeah. And he goes, could you put that up? I want to hear it again. And so I, I whipped the other tape off. I put the, the, the other tape on and, and I wrote, rewind it and we listened to the whole thing. And sure enough, and the tape falls off, pff, 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 tape falls off. And he goes, he nods his head. He goes, yeah. And he walks, walks out into the studio and he he starts working on another song, completely different song. So I put another reel of tape up and start working on that. And, and uh, so we're working on that for about an hour. And about an hour later, he goes, uh, hey, Macasia, you know that song where the tape ran out? And I go, yes. <laughs> and he goes, could we listen to that again? Yeah, of course. So I whipped the other tape off, put that tape on. We listened to the whole song from beginning to end. And the tape falls off. And, and uh, meanwhile, and I'm starting to go, Oh God, I'm such a jerk. And he was teaching me a lesson. The lesson he taught me was don't you ever run out of tape on me. If you think that there's a possibility, there's not enough tape, you put another fresh reel up. Cause I don't really care how much the tape costs. All I care about is getting the take. And uh, so I never ran out of tape on him ever again. And uh, it was the greatest lesson I ever learned. I mean, he, he, he taught, he didn't yell. He didn't scream. He didn't, he didn't embarrass me. He just had me listen to it over and over again. And, and till I got, <laughs> I got it, you know, I was like, just to hear yeah. that sound of the tape ending. Yeah. No kidding. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it, it, that was the way he would teach me stuff that way. And it was, it was an amazing way to be taught. And, uh, I really loved it. And I, I love him. I thought he was awesome. So. And I guess the experience was so good that he brought you back again then for the next one. Yes, he did. He brought me back for uh, um, World Gone Wrong. And World Gone Wrong actually is a fantastic record. Good As I've Been to You is not as good a record as as World Gone Wrong. And, and the bottom line is, um, really the honest truth is, Bob did an awesome pro awesome job on everything he did it was me uh, i just wasn't a good enough engineer to make that the kind of record he wanted to make he wanted to make a really rough raw sounding record and i didn't know how to do that and feel good about it and so i didn't do it and uh, i feel really bad about that i regret that uh to this day uh, but i'm really thankful that that record did come out world gone wrong came out as good as it did it actually won a grammy uh best folk album of the year and uh those songs were amazing songs incredible and bob's performances were just 
breathtaking. Um, it was like having him give me a concert every, every day for like three months, you know, sing just for me and just for Debbie gold, you know, pretty breathtaking. Um, uh, and I've talked with other people who've had experiences with Bob and produced stuff for Bob. And they, they've looked at me like, what are you talking about? Bob never does that. You know, <laughs> he never takes 20 <laughs> takes of a song. He does. He gives you one, maybe two takes and that's it. And it's like, and you're done. And it's like, no, with Bob, when I worked with Bob, he did like, there were one, there was one song we did 60 takes of one song before Holy he finally got crap. it right. Yeah. It was amazing. Uh, I really, Got it. I really understood. Uh, I don't know if I understood Bob. I don't think I, you know, I don't know who does, but, but I got it. Uh, I got where he's coming from and why he's considered such a great guy and why he's such a great artist and a great performer and, and uh, a great writer. And, and so, you know, it was, it was pretty awesome. And, and Debbie Gold was the one Debbie and he were friends uh, for years, she worked for him for years and, uh, she was the one that got me that gig. So, um, I will always be thankful to Deb for that. So. It's always fun to hear from someone who worked directly with Bob. And I think the clarity we get here about the amount of good as I've been to you outtakes is incredible. 60 takes. I wonder which song that was. If we look at Dylan's schedule that year, there aren't any three-month breaks where this could have taken place. There's a month from mid-July to mid-August, and then a few weeks of touring, followed by another three weeks free, starting in mid-September. So that's likely when all this happened. For context, the 30th anniversary concert happened just after, in mid-October, and Good As I've Been To You was released at the end of October in 1992. Seven months later, in May 1993, with just a six-week break in between a year of nearly constant touring, Dylan called Makasha back to the house, and they did the recording for World Gone Wrong. That album came out in late October 1993, almost a year after Good As I've Been To You. We're going to talk about those years, those albums, the songs on them, and look at it from a whole bunch of points of view with some great guests over the next few episodes. Before we talk, however, in 2023 about these albums, I wanted to look back and see what reviewers thought of them at the time they came out. That's all we have time Today for here, but the extended version of this episode has more of the Makasha interview and a look back at the original Good As I've Been To You reviews. Here's a sample of what subscribers can hear in the extended episode. On Good As I've Been To You, we're here Dylan as he is now, playing material that is worth communicating. Dylan inhabiting the first-person narratives as if he's lived them twice. An album of covers, not goofy and detached like self-portrait, or quirky and wildly uneven like Down In The Groove, but affectionate, modest, intimate, and committed. Little Maggie turns to alcohol as a temporary solution to her relational troubles. Two men violently beat a pair of army recruiters after being verbally threatened in Arthur McBride. Even more than that, the album's intimate, almost offhand approach suggests what it would be like to sit backstage with his bobness while he runs through a set of his sometimes favorite old songs. These are clearly powerful reviews, and this is just a sample. It shows that what Dylan did in his garage was significant and perhaps tells us something about how that album and the next one put in the base that he could build from. Did you know there's an extended version of the show? Subscribers get a private feed that delivers extended episodes, often two or three times as long, plus bonus episodes. Join us as an FM Plus or premium subscriber and get access to the private feed for this podcast and every FM Podcast Network show. See the show notes for links and details. Did you enjoy this show? Then please rate this podcast and leave a review. It really helps. And take a moment to follow this podcast so you don't miss upcoming episodes. Thanks for listening.